Those of us here at Colorado State University are proud to share with you this session of Endoscopy Talks. When you're looking for inspiring veterinary CE experiences, think CSU Vet CE. Nestled up against the Rocky Mountains in our new State of the Future facility, we invite you to experience what we call CE Elevated. We'd love to see you in one of our future on-site, online, or blended courses. Check us out at www.csuvetce.com. Now, please enjoy Endoscopy Talks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Endoscopy Talks. I'm Christopher Chamnus with Carl Stortz, and I'd like to thank you for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's Translational Medicine Institute, also known as the TMI. Today's presentation is on endoscopic spinal surgery. Our speaker, Hiroaki Kamishina, graduated vet school in 1996 in Ebetsu, Hokkaido, Japan. He continued his studies at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine, where he earned a master's degree in radiology, as well as a PhD in neurology. Dr. Kamishina is currently an associate professor of small animal radiology and neurology at Gifu University in Japan. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it to Dr. Kamishina. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure for me to have a chance to talk about endoscopic spinal surgery today. I am Hiroki Kamishina. Uh, I'm a, a neurologist and neurosurgeon at Gifu University in Japan. Uh, I'm going to talk about endoscopic endoscopic spinal surgery today. Hope you enjoy my talk and excited about learning a new technique. So uh, MISS, minimally invasive spinal surgery. Uh, it's a relatively new technique. Uh, that I think the first report in veterinary medicine was about in 2016. It's it's been around only 20 years, even in human medicine. It's, it's a new technique. So I'm gonna cover uh, principles of endosc endoscopic spinal surgery, uh, instruments and procedures of MED, MEL, and PED. These are the three major surgical techniques we use. I'm gonna also talk about indications and contraindications and uh, possible uh, complications of these techniques. So when I first started uh, spinal surgery about 15 years ago, uh, I was making a big uh, skin incision and uh, many uh, muscle retractions then open up and expose the spinal uh, vertebrae in order to get access to the uh, disc that I'm going to do a surgery on. So similar to this image, you see uh, uh, screws in it. So it's a different kind of surgery, but it's a similar uh, surgical field that we uh, used to uh, see. But I was always thinking about making a small, less invasive incision to get an access to the disc because the actual surgical field is about a centimeter or two centimeters at most, in most cases. So with the use of endoscope, we can actually make a very small skin incision, uh, no bigger than the actual surgical field uh, when you're treating uh, disc uh, diseases in most cases. So these are three different kinds of surgeries. The uh, left side is an open surgery, with, which is probably more uh, uh, familiar with most of you. You basically cut the skin and cut the muscles, retract them to expose the bone. And then you take out the, the uh, disc extruded into the vertebral canal. With endoscope, uh, you basically stick a tube, which is called tubular retractor, 
and insert a telescope and all instruments in the tube to get access to the target. Uh, this is called MED or MEL. I'm, go I'm gonna talk about these techniques later. And finally, uh, the least invasive technique is called a, a percutaneous endoscopic surgery, a PED is basically you stick a, a tiny scope in the surgical field and you insert all instruments in the endoscope. So very uh, tiny skin incision muscle damage to create. So these are the image from dogs that I did surgeries on in the past. Two images on the top is from a dog that received open surgery. What happens is that if you retract the muscles from the bone, they're gonna be uh, severely atrophied and replaced, the, but replaced by fat tissues. So you see all fat tissues on the side of the surgery compared to the normal side. So you need to be very careful not to damage the soft tissues, especially the muscle. So it's not the matter of the size of the skin incision, but it's what happens in under the skin, which is the muscle. So with the use of endoscope, the muscle damage is minimum. So you don't get uh, severe muscle atrophy uh, after the operation. So you see, this is a dog we did a PED. You see a, a bone a defect here that we created. The muscle on the side of the surgery is very well preserved compared to the, the other side. So this is a, the biggest advantage of uh, MISS. So why MISS? Like I said, skin uh, incision is small, small, but more importantly, less damage to soft tissues, less scarring, less post-operative pain, and the, all of these lead to faster recovery of the patient. Uh, reduce blood loss and reduce risk. Having post-operative complications are also the advantages of MISS. Um, indications include uh, intervertebral disc disease, uh, vertebral canal stenosis, Wobler syndrome and spinal tumor, but many other uh, diseases can be treated with MISS. Uh, surgical techniques include hemilaminectomy, mini hemilaminectomy, and so on. And usually discectomy is combined with these techniques in the case of intervertebral disc diseases. You can do a bio biopsies with MISS. And I, can, I will talk about that in the last session. There is a definitely a steep learning curve of this technique because of uh, several reasons. Uh, it's a very narrow surgical field. So you have to know where you are. You have to identify landmarks, make sure you are in the right location. And this is the, the I think the most difficult part of this surgery. The telescope has an angle. It's a forward oblique viewing. It's usually 25 degrees. It's a 2D view because of the surgical field is uh, displayed on the monitor and you need a vision hand coordination. And these are similar to laparoscopy or arthroscopy, I think. So there is a learning curve. So, I'm gonna first talk about MED, microendoscopic disectomy. The system we, we use is called EasyGo2. It's by uh, Carl Stoltz. It's, this is a second generation system. 
it basically had three different length of telescopes and three different sizes of uh, tubular retractors. And each tubular re retractor has three different lengths. We usually use the middle size, the green series, which is a, a 19 millimeter in diameter, or the smallest one, orange series, which is uh, 15 millimeters in diameter. You need to have a, a setup. You uh, need a, a light source and video system and a monitor. You need to have a, a, a camera head. The, uh, the HD version is very good, good enough for the surgery, but if you have a chance to use a 4K system, which, which is uh, even better. And as far as the positioning of the animal, you can either use a lateral recumbency or ventral recumbency. And I like to use somewhere in between like 30 degrees or 40 degrees, like oblique lateral recumbency. So it's gonna be like this. So this is for an approach for the mini hemilaminectomy the tubular retractor is going to be attached to the uh, vertebral arc or pedicle like this in lumbar vertebra. In the thoracic area, it's going to be tilted up a little bit because of the angle of the vertebral arc and the attachment of the rib. The first thing is same as um, open surgery, the surgical site localization, you we simply uh, stick a needle to the surgical field and take a radiograph and make sure you are in the right location. The uh, location of the skin incision depends on the target disc that you're gonna treat and also the surgical techniques that you choose. But this is not a definite uh, thing because skin moves and stretches. And the size of the skin incision is around two centimeters in the case of uh, smallest troca tubular retractor or around three centimeters uh, in a case of green series, the middle one. Landmarks are very important because you don't want to get lost. You have to be very sure about where you are. Some of the landmarks you can use are spinous processes and the articular process and accessory process. And you can simply stick your finger in the surgical field after skin incision and palpate these landmarks and make sure that you are in the right direction and right location. And this is called finger navigation, a very important step in this procedure. And the very unique step in this procedure is serial dilation. You, uh, instead of cutting the muscles and retracting the muscle from the bone, you're kind of splitting the muscle fibers and go in between the muscles to get access to the bone. And you do this by inserting a, uh, what's called uh, dilation sleeves. You start with the smallest one, cover with the next one and next one and next one till you, till you get the size of the uh, tubular retractor. So this way you don't damage the the muscles, you dilate the muscles and get the, the access. This is a very unique step of this uh, uh, surgical technique. Uh, after you uh, inserted the tubular retractor in the surgical field, uh, the tube is attached to the holding arm and the holding arm is, is fixed to the surgical table. You attach the camera head 
and light cable, and you're ready to go. This is the pre preparation step of this procedure. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop here. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask. Yes, Dr. Kamishina, I have a couple of questions. Um, first one is regarding surgical time. How does it compare to an open surgery, the amount of time it takes? Okay, I think the first couple of cases, you have a hard time figuring out what the location and the size of the skin incision and everything. So it's gonna take time than open surgery. But when you, when you get used to it, it's not gonna be that different compared to the open surgery. And it, it can be even shorter because uh, this, the, for example, the closing step is very fast in this uh, endoscopic surgery. Okay. Are there any studies that look at the recovery rate of open surgery versus minimally invasive? The recovery rate, the, uh, the clinical outcome, you mean? Yeah, yes, uh, the, the amount of time it takes them to get to a certain point of recovery. Is it similar? Is it uh, From anesthesia. Sorry? No, no, I mean, from, I mean from the surgery, recovery from the surgery itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I think it's not, also it's not very different between uh, open surgeries and uh, uh, endoscopic surgeries because maybe it's even faster in endoscopic surgery because it's minimally invasive, less pain. Okay. What is the best position for the holding arm? Yeah, it's a good question. We uh, try several ways, but usually the, uh, the holding part of the tubular retractor is going to be like 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock. This is because the directions from which we insert the uh, instruments in the tube, but you can turn around and, and try several ways, but usually we do, we position the top of the tube in 12 o'clock direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. What is the smallest size of patients on which you've performed this technique? And do you well, often perform on very small patients as well? Yes, um, we have many small dogs in Japan. We don't have like a big uh, 50 kilograms uh, giant breed uh, dog here. So we always treat small dogs like uh, 1.5 kilograms, 1.2 kilograms, and it's, it's, it's possible. And it's still worth it, you know, minimal invasive surgery in small dogs is, is still worth it, I think. Okay, one last question for now. You said there's a steep learning curve. Do you have any tips for learning this technique faster? Okay. Well, um, it's always good to try with the bigger size trocar, tubular retractor, one size bigger than you should be using because it's much easier. It's, uh, you can do, you can start with the uh, open surgery and just uh, place a tubular retractor and see how it looks and get the comfort, comfortable with it. So. That's the one way to do this. Of course, you need uh, uh, training like uh, cadaver training and dry lab. And those trainings are very helpful. You don't wanna just buy this instru instruments and try your first patient. You have to uh, get very uh, good uh, training to do this, I think. But uh, bigger trucker should help. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all for now. Okay, then uh, let's move on. So removal of tough, soft tissue is very important. You wanna have a clean surgical field, clean bone surface, otherwise you won't know where you are to ident and identify the anatomy. So to do that, uh, we usually first coagulate the muscles so that they can easily detach 
from the bone. You, you just can't pull the bone, pull the muscles because muscles keep coming in from the uh, outside of the trocar. So you wanna coagulate the muscles and then remove the muscles. So you, you know the, you, you can see clearly the surgical field. Let's just skip the uh, movie here. So now you can see is an accessory process where you wanna drill and make a hole, which is the uh, procedure for mini hemilaminectomy. You also want a uh, good uh, bipolar forceps. We have bipolar forceps with uh, a tip angle to different directions is help. And then once you know where you are, you're gonna remove the bone and, and you can use a high speed bar. Uh, we usually use a round bar with a diameter of two to three millimeters. Uh, there is a steel bar and a diamond bar. We start with a steel bar because it's faster, but when it gets, to, gets close to uh, important structures like spinal cord and knob roots and vessels, you want to change it to diamond bar because it's safer. You can use a kerosene punch as well. <clears throat> so again, the same surgical feel, you're looking at the accessory process and uh, removing the, bar, uh, the bone with a two millimeter steel bar. Uh, the assistant will need to pour a water every once in a while and uh, suction it so the surgeon can see the clear surgical field. So if you get a good surgical field, it looks like this very clear. The surgical field is right in front of you. In front of you. There's no muscle uh, covering the surgical field. Very nice view. And uh, kerosene bone punch is also helpful. Uh, usually in small dose, we use uh, the smallest kerosene bone punch, which is a, with a, a tip uh, of one millimeter in width, very small, just to uh, kind of trim the edge of the bone, the, uh, bone window. And, and uh, then you want to remove disc materials in a case of uh, intervertebral disc diseases. Uh, these are the instruments I use in an open surgery, curette and knob hooks. Uh, but uh, curettes and knob hooks for endoscopic surgery are usually a little bit longer and have angled so that you can um, manipulate these instruments easier. So now we are going to remove the extruded disc nucleus pulposus. So I'm gonna use the knob, knob hook to kind of probe what was what the disc and what is the spinal cord. This is a part of the disc extruded into this uh, vertebral canal. And underneath it, you can see a, a spinal cord here. You can use a grasper. Uh, this is also a very small grasper, but a, a one millimeter in width. That's another disc material. And make sure you uh, take up most of the disc materials excluded and de de decompress the spinal cord. As far as hemostasis, if it is a big heavy bleeding, you can insert a gauze and apply a gentle pressure and weight and usually it stops the bleeding. Uh, if you can identify the 
ruptured best, uh, vessel and uh, the, the bleeding, you can uh, use a bipolar forceps and to coagulate the vessel. And this usually works well. Like uh, uh, this image movie. And uh, if you're working on tumors, they bleed a lot and you, you don't know where the blood is coming from. You can use a, a hemostatic agent like, a, like gel foam and you can just place it and apply a gentle pressure and wait and usually it stops the bleeding. Like that. And if, uh, if it doesn't stop, uh, you can just leave this hemostatic agent there. Uh, if you can take it out, that's I think better. So closing, the closing part is very uh, easy and fast in, in endoscopic surgery. Uh, you, we usually don't uh, suture the muscle layer because when you pull back the system back, uh, the muscles usually come back to the original position. But if it is a big uh, dead space, you can uh, place a drainage tube for a day or two, but usually you don't have to do that because it kind of comes back. And also you check any bleeding especially for muscle layers, sometimes it bleeds. So if it bleeds, you're gonna uh, stop it by coagulation. In this case, it's bleeding from here. You don't wanna leave it because uh, it may create the hematoma in the surgical field that potentially compresses spinal cord and you have to open it up again. But the uh, closing part is very fast and easy. And you suture the skin one stitch or two stitches and that's it, it's very fast. Okay. So I'm gonna show you a couple of cases here. This is a, a six year old cardigan Welsh Corgi with uh, uh, to the history of hind limb dragging, it's a kind of a typical presentation of acute uh, disc problem. Uh, he has almost a complete, completely paralyzed uh, hind limbs. Um, so we uh, decided to do endoscopy. Uh, his MRI, you can see a uh, uh, pretty big uh, disc uh, material it's, uh, in this vertebral canal pushing the spinal cord. This is T12, T13, uh, probably calcified disc materials extruded and the spinal cord is compressed about three centimeters from the skin surface. So it's a good candidate for uh, MED. Here's the CT, you can see the calcified disc material inside the vertebral canal. The spinal cord is compressed to the other, to, to the other side. So we, we did the MED, we uh, uh, dilated the muscles. We used uh, 19 by 40 millimeters uh, tubular retractor. It's a, middle size green series. And did a uh, laminectomy first with the bar steel bar. It's an old system. So the, the quality of the image is not quite well, but still it's, it's good enough, I think, to do the surgery. Uh, after removing the bone, you, we can see the disc materials here. So I'm gonna try to uh, uh, remove them. You see the spinal cord over there. 
So I want to remove the discs as much as possible to get a good decompression of the spinal cord. So here's post-op, uh, pre-op CT images and post-op CT images. Here is the bone defect I, uh, I created uh, to get access to the vertebral canal. It's a kind of a somewhere between mini hemi and mini hemi, uh, hemilaminectomy. But most of the uh, disc materials in the uh, vertebral canal was taken out. Uh, the skin incisions is about 2.2 centimeters. And this is a two weeks post-op uh, recheck. He was uh, working okay, still kind of wobbly, but uh, no pain and happy. So that was a very typical case for MED. So next I'm gonna talk about MEL, microendoscopy endoscopic laminectomy. We uh, use this mainly for cervical, sur uh, cervical disc surgeries. Like this dog, this has uh, a multiple cervical disc protrusions. C5-6 being the most severe one, but also uh, four, five and six, seven, uh, moderate to mild uh, compression of the spinal cord. Uh, we, of course we can do uh, multiple ventral slot procedures for each uh, disc, but in a very small dog, it's very uh, time consuming and it's gonna be a very tough surgery from the ventral side. So we decided to go from the dorsal side using the endoscope. So basically we are going to remove the roof of the vertebra of C5 and C6 to decompress the spinal surgery dorsally with MEL. So it's the dorsal view is gonna be like this. It's a small chihuahua. Uh, so we're gonna remove the roof of the spine here. In dorsal uh, surgical region, there is a nuchal ligament that we don't wanna don't want to cut. So, First, I visually uh, inspect and identify the ligament, retract the ligament to one side, and then stick the tubular retractor. Like this, this is a radiograph. I make sure the tubular retractor is directing to the right location. We use the smallest tubular retractor. In, in this case, it's a, 15 by 40 millimeters, the orange one, the shortest one. It's like this uh, is a C6 vertebral arc. This is a spinous process. You want to remove the muscles from the bone first and then remove the bone and decompress the spinal cord. So first I use a, a steel bar. This is, I think a two millimeter uh, diameter steel bar. Uh, Chiwa has a very thin vertebral arc. So you, maybe you can use, we can start with a carousel punch to remove the arc, but it's a little bit faster to, if you use a drill. So uh, you can see the, uh, Spinal cord here. I'm gonna try to uh, remove the open the laminectomy with a carousel punch. This is uh, safer to decompress the spinal cord. So I did C6 laminectomy first, and then move on to the next one, is which is C5. So this is called winding technique in human. Uh, if you, when you finish the first location, you're gonna, you're gonna move to the next location by tilting the system to either cranially or caudally. 
in this case, cranially, to uh, get C5 uh, vertebral arc in, this, in the monitor. So move it, try not to get muscles trapped, but you, you, you want to be very careful not to uh, push the spinal cord because you already laminectomized this area. So remove the muscles on C5 vertebral arc and then do the same procedure. Okay, so we did uh, two dorsal laminectomies in this case on one incision, C5, C6 is pre-op and this is post-op. So very uh, nice uh, laminectomies we did, I think, and dog recovered very well. The skin incision about uh, three centimeters, which is not very small, but not too big for dorsal approach for two uh, vertebr for uh, two uh, dorsal laminectomies. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, if anybody have question, yes, you have any questions? I have a couple of questions. The first one is in the cervical spine, what other surgeries can you do with an endoscope? Can you do, for example, a ventral approach for the mm -hmm. cervical area? Okay, uh, we can do ventral, but uh, usually ventral approach is, uh, it's not very invasive technique. So unless you have a, a giant breed dog, uh, I would just do a usual open surgery ventral approach. Uh, you can, from dorsal approach, you can do a dorsal laminectomy that uh, I just showed you, or you can do a hemilaminectomy from a little bit uh, to the lateral side. But I think those are the two uh, major surgeries we usually do with the uh, cervical area. Okay. Next question. Do we need a fat graft? to prevent adhesion of the cord? Um, uh, you can do a fat graft. We, you, we usually don't do that unless there is a uh, inflammation or tumor that uh, we anticipate uh, severe scar tissue and adhesion pass up. But uh, for this, surgery, we don't do fat graft, but some, I know some people prefer, prefer to do that. Uh, it's, uh, I think your preference. Okay. Uh, regarding saline, the use of saline when you're using a burr, do you have a continuous drip going while you're using the burr or do you apply saline before using the burr? Well, the assistants uh, pour uh, saline in the surgical field every once in a while. Th this is for cooling the bone the tissue and also removing the bone debris from the surgical field so that you can see the clear surgical field. Uh, so it's during the, I think, boring step. Okay, one last question. How do you localize the surgery site in the cervical laminectomy, especially in larger dogs? Okay. Um, the side of the surgery. Yeah. Either you go from the left or right, right? So um, I think it depends on the, the, uh, the uh, location of the compression. If it is completely midline compression, I usually uh, choose dorsal laminectomy. If, if it is like right side compression, I may choose uh, right side hemilaminectomy. So it's depend on the uh, location of the compression. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the last section, uh, PED, percut uh, percutaneous endoscopic discectomy, which is the least invasive technique. And we started this, uh, uh, I think last year, yeah, I think last year we started this uh, 
surgery and found that this is just an amazing technique. So the system we use is spine tip from Carl Stoltz. Uh, <clears throat> the telescope looks like this. And as, as I said before, uh, all instruments go into the working channel of the telescope, which is about 3.6 millimeters in width. The telescope, the out, out of diameter of this telescope is only about 6.6 .6 millimeters. It has irrigation and suction channels on both sides and optical lens. These are the uh, uh, instruments called working sheath. Uh, it's equivalent to tubular retractors in MED and MAL, but it's much uh, smaller. Dilation sleeves, sleeves, and instruments for us for the uh, PED. The difference between PED and MED is uh, first we are doing a surgery in a water under the water. So uh, we use a pump and and this pumps constantly flow fluid in the surgical field, and it washes all kind of debris. Small bleeding like this is going to be washed out. So you constantly have clear vision, which is the biggest advantage of PED. But uh, it's going to be very even smaller surgical field compared to MED. This is a surgical field in MED. This is a surgical field in PED, much smaller. So you have to know the anatomy very, uh, I think the hardest part of uh, this procedure. So we use a technique called discography. Basically you inject the dye in the, in, uh, in the disc so that you know the, the disc to work on. You usually uh, inject radiopaque contrast medium. So you, you can check the location by radiograph as well, as well. So discography helps a lot. This is a case where we didn't do discography. And first we did PED and you see a spinal cord and our root. I was trying to find the extruded disc because um, I must be in the right location. I must be approaching from the right side, but I couldn't find the disc. I'm trying to kind of uh, probe underneath the, the spinal cord, but wasn't sure where the disc material is. So I gave up, I, I converted to open surgery and uh, using a microscope, the disc material is just in front of me, this brownish uh, structure is definitely a protruded disc materials. So it was a like a magic. So I, I think I was just so used to this color and texture, I couldn't find the disc in PED. So they, they look different the color and texture. So you have to know how they look under endoscopy. So this is why discography is very important. And I will show you the, another example later. So skin incision is, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's small. It's about the size of the surgical blade. Uh, we usually make a kind of a stabby uh, incision all the way to the bone, cut the skin and muscle together, and then uh, dilate the muscles with dil dilation sleeves. It's a similar step uh, to other procedures, MED and MEL. But the sleeves are small because the endoscope is smaller like that, and then 
insert a work a working sheets here. Try to remove the muscle from the surface of the bone with dilation sleep and working sheets so that you can see the bone after inserting the telescope. But still you get muscles in between, so you have to remove those. And I use a bipolar, special bipolar for PED. And this works very well. So you're gonna co uh, coagulate the muscles, get them shrunk and then uh, dissect them, remove from the bone surface and get a very nice clear surgical view. So now you can see an accessory process here. This is a, the accessory process. And this is where you're gonna make a hole to do a mini hemilaminectomy. Uh, the drill is similar, but longer because of this uh, long uh, telescope. This is, a, I think, a two millimeters uh, diamond bar we are using here. But the, the technique is pretty much the same for MED. So here you can see a blue disc materials because we injected uh, the dye, that the dye is called indigo carmine. It's a blue dye. Because we injected the dye in this disc, you can, uh, it's, it's so easy to identify the disc materials because it's colored in blue. So this is the extruded uh, nucleus proposis that was pushing the spinal cord. So discography helps a lot. So we uh, try to do this in every patient. And uh, uh, closing the wound is very simple. Like uh, MED, you just pull the um, system back and make sure there's no bleeding. If it bleeds, you coagulate and stop with bipolar forceps. And muscle usually come back, so you don't have to suture the muscle layer and just suture the skin one or two stitches. Very simple step. Okay. So this is a case. It's uh, again uh, disc uh, extrusion, and very typical acute. Uh, paralyzed duct front that we see here. It's a complete paralysis. It's no deep pain sensation. So it's what's called grade five. Uh, this problem, he had the T1213, this extrusions, the very big uh, uh, disc there. So we did mini hemilaminectomy with PED and the, the next day of the surgery, he already uh, uh, moves his legs and of course he's wagging his tail. And this is the, the bone defect that we created, mini hemilaminectomy. The skin incision is about less than a centimeter. This is two week post-op recheck. He is still wobbly, but working very, well, this is a different case. Uh, if you have two discs extruded, if it is next to each other, you can go from one incision. But if it is like this, two, is it two, three, L2, three and L5, six, it's far apart. You can do uh, two different PEDs and two different mini hemilaminectomies and still a uh, very minimal, minimally invasive technique. So this is this big dog has a huge disc extrusion in T12 uh, disc space, which is a bit unusual place to see disc extrusions, but very big uh, calcified disc extruded and pushing the spinal cord to the other side. So we decided for sure 
In this case, to do a PED has a very deep surgical uh, location. And we found very uh, humongous disc material next to the spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord. You see the disc materials, a little bit yellow. And when we popped it, it the blood comes out from the uh, disc material. It's kind of scary, but uh, fluid washes out. So you always have good surgical field, which is good. So we and remove the disc materials and hematoma inside as much as possible. Here's a bone defect from the uh, laminectomy. This is uh, uh, we suture two stitches of the skin, which is very small for this location of the surgery. A good uh, technique for this kind of big dog as well. So we did the surgery in cat too. So this is a young uh, Scottish fold uh, with uh, back pain and high limb uh, laminus. Uh, he's in pain because of the bone growth pushing the spinal cord right here is T4. You see the bone growth hypertrophy of the bone uh, pushing the spinal cord. So I think uh, we uh, suspected this to be uh, osteochondral dysplasia, which is sometimes seen in this uh, cat, uh, usually in distal extremities, but sometimes in the spine. So we decided to go with the PED and decompress the spinal cord. And the surgery went very well. He was... Uh, uh, very happy, no pain. Um, uh, his walking is much better than uh, pre-op. So even in a cat, this is a good technique to try, I think. Then the skin incision was about nine millimeters. So this is the last case, it's a tumor. Uh, he had a big extra dural tumor right next to the spinal cord. This is again T1, T2. Tumor bleeds a lot. So we uh, the major goal was to biopsy the tumor, but also we wanted to take out the tumor as much as possible. So we tried and take out the tumor, uh, decompress the sp uh, spinal cord. And uh, again, even in a small dog, in this location, this is pretty uh, deep site to work on with open surgery. So some of the contraindications and complications, these are all reported in human medicine. And I don't know uh, if they all apply to animals, uh, but uh, we have to look into this, uh, uh, these kind of a thing in the few, uh, future research. Uh, the, as far as complication, not root injury and dual tear, is are the major complications in human, of course, uh, also spinal cord injury is, is something we have to worry about. So in conclusion, um, I wanna say the endoscopic spinal surgery is very uh, good technique with, with the minimum muscle and bone trauma, which is the biggest thing. Post-operative pain is minimum, so they, and recover rapidly, but there is a steep learning curve. Um, we need to uh, have a cadaver training and dry lab training. I'm working on a, uh, with the Japanese company, company to make a good uh, spine model for PED uh, for dogs. So uh, it's gonna be available sometime this year. It's a promising minimally invasive technique for not only this disease, but other various spinal cord disease in small animals, I think. So this is all I have today. Oh, that thing, this is the dog named Cheeky. We did the two laminectomies with PED and he came to us a couple of days ago for recheck. He had uh, uh, one leg amputated uh, uh, in the past. Uh, he had also hip joint problems. 
So we really wanted to have a minimally invasive surgery for his disc problems. And did, uh, he, he, he went very well, he's happy uh, dog now. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, then you can directly contact me at my email address. But uh, if you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer. Yes, Dr. Kamishina, I have a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the first one is, can I use this instrument set for any other minimal invasive surgery purposes or procedures outside of spine? Okay, uh, the only surgery we did or our surgeon did here at our university was the uh, uh, for our tightest media, the ear surgery from the ventral approach. Uh, it, you, because you have very uh, important nerves and vessels here. You don't want to open them up because you're going to get a facial paralysis and all kinds of stuff. So he used this system to open the, uh, to treat the otitis media in the past. A couple of cases he did and it well very well, I thought. So that's the only thing I know. Okay. Can we do discography in Hansen type one herniation discs? Okay. Yes, you, we can because uh, the, the movie I showed you was a Hansen type one, this nucleus proposal extrusion. And I don't know the me mechanism of it, but if you inject the dye, some dye goes into the disc, uh, extruded disc materials. So it still helps. Of course, you can use it for Hansen type two disc protrusion, and that's what people always do in, in human medicine. What is the better access to extrusion disc in L7 S1? Good question. Because of the ilia, ilium, uh, you can't really go from the lateral side. It's going to be either a uh, complete dorsal approach or a little bit uh, lateral, dorsal lateral approach. But uh, I think the dorsal approach is the, the uh, realistic choice, I think. And you can do a laminectomy, you can retract the nerve roots, coda equina, and then get access to the discs that protrude it and remove them uh, with a grass bar or something like that, yeah. So those approach should be the uh, good way to do it. Okay. Is there a, a cost, a big cost difference between open procedures and minimally invasive to the clients, to the animal owners? Yes, um, I think uh, you need to have a complete setup for the uh, uh, endoscopic surgery, the um, uh, equipment that you, you, you don't use for open surgery, like a video system and light source and monitor and everything. So you have to invest those equipment first, but uh, other um, uh, instruments are also uh, specialized to uh, endoscopy surgery. So they cost first, but uh, I think because of the minimally invasive nature, it, they all worth it. And one final question, where can I learn this procedure? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the biggest problem right now. Uh, I, I know uh, CSU is uh, uh, having a wet lab uh, uh, this year, I think. And uh, like I said, um, cadaver training is the ideal uh, training that you, you want to uh, get, but uh, it's, it's very limited that uh, you can uh, do those kind of training. So dry lab is the next one that you can do. Uh, like I said, we are making a model. You can also buy a model from uh, Soul Bones in the United States, I think. So you can use those. Uh, you should use those first and before you try on your patient. Like I said, uh, you can do the open surgery first and try endoscopic surgery in that surgery to see how, you know, how it goes. And you have to train yourself like, like that. Yep. Okay. 
Dr. Kamishina, thank you so much for a really interesting presentation on these new techniques. We thank appreciate you very much. It very much. A reminder for those of you in the audience who are native Japanese speakers, you may wish to stay tuned for the Japanese version of this webinar, which will begin in about three minutes. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. In two weeks, we will hear from Dr. Dean Hendrickson at Colorado State University about the benefits of minimally invasive surgery in large exotic and wild animals. Dr. Hendrickson has extensive experience with MIS in a variety of species, including horses, zebras, dolphins, rhinoceros, even elephants. Actually, quite a bit of experience doing laparoscopy on elephants. So please join us for this exciting session on March 24th at 8 p.m. New York time. And in the meantime, we wish you all the very best of health. Hi, my name is Lisa Bartner, and I am one of the board certified neurologists here at Colorado State University. I'm excited to invite you to attend our minimally invasive neurosurgery course taking place here at the Translational Medicine Institute. Minimally invasive surgery of the spine has been gaining widespread use in human medicine since the 90s, affording shorter surgical times, decreased intraoperative bleeding, shorter durations of hospital stay and postoperative analgesics, and decreased complications. As our instrumentation becomes more sophisticated and more available in veterinary medicine, the development of these minimally invasive procedures in our patients is in motion. With only a handful of studies in cadaver dogs, a few case reports, and some clinical trials underway, minimally invasive spine surgery is still in its, in its infancy, but gaining ground very quickly. And clients are already requesting these procedures. In minimally invasive surgery of the spine, a tubular retractor system is used to dilate the muscles rather than to dissect them. By using sequentially larger retractors, the working channel is expanded without cutting muscles. Working under magnification, the desired surgical approach, usually for decompression, can then be performed. The goals of minimally invasive spine surgery are essentially the same as open approaches with the added benefits of minimizing muscle dissection, lessening disruption of ligamentous attachments, and reducing collateral damage to soft tissues and human surgical patients also report po less post-operative pain. In the right patient population, we can achieve our desired intent of performing our surgical technique with the least amount of iatrogenic trauma as possible, but without sacrificing the outcome of the procedure nor the principles of surgery. In this course, we will take you through the fundamentals and indications of minimally invasive spine surgery we will give you an understanding of the instrumentation as well as guide you in proper patient selection. And finally, we'll demonstrate the procedures and techniques in a cadaver neurosurgery laboratory. Our goal is that at the end of this one-day course, those of you already routinely performing spinal surgery will be able to begin integrating minimally invasive techniques into your practice. And those of you not performing these procedures will have the opportunity to get hands-on appreciation for these novel procedures and techniques when offering referral to your clients. Thanks, and we look forward to seeing you soon.